So things we know to be true, right? Fertile soil grows more nutrient-dense food. And the modern decline in vegetable nutrient density is a result of poor farming practices and nutrient-depleted soil. Who would say that is not true, right? This is pretty uncontroversial. This part is true, right? These levels have been declining significantly. So vitamin C down almost 60%. These are big, big differences. No wonder we're taking multivitamins. This part, the reason for it, is everywhere. I would say in the last even six months, I've heard this dozens of times, because of soil depletion, crops grown decades ago were much richer in vitamins and minerals than the varieties most of us get today. So this is what is repeated everywhere, especially like in regenerative agriculture when the focus is on soil and compost. And I'm not gonna say that the Focus shouldn't be there, but it also needs to focus on something else, which we will get to. So this is what I focused on for years. Soil testing, remineralizing, adding, adding calcium, farming practices. You know, we're growing cover crops and organic no-till with a draft horse. And one thing you aren't seeing here is the focus on seeds. We are buying seeds every year. Sometimes they were struggling. For, I would say, most of my life was this focus on, on soil. And then a couple of years ago, I read a report that caused me to have to rethink some things. So this was the Bionutrient Food Association. They did a giant multi-year survey. All these green little dots are farmers sending in produce samples and sending in soil samples. And what's really cool is that these results included data that was combined. So they would test the crop test the soil, answers to all these questions, are you using compost, are you irrigating, all those things, combine them in a giant data set. And their goal was to show that regenerative farming practices or better quality soil increase produce quality. And so I read this report to confirm what I already knew, right? That's what we do. And um, I got to the end of the report, and this is a screenshot from it. No obvious relationship between soil biological activity and any of the food quality measures. No obvious trends either by antioxidants, polyphenols, or minerals. And at this point, I was like, <clears throat> this is a little alarming, but I'm not too worried because they just haven't found it. Just give me that data. I will find it, and I will tell them what they've missed. <laughs> it's an open source project. All this data is available. So I downloaded it, and I um, spent a couple of weeks on it. I stopped eating regularly and I... <laughs> this was not just challenging what I knew about nutrient density. There were other things that, you know, you hear a lot when you're a gardener and a farmer about bricks and all the things you should be doing and how they matter. And then this data set caused me to like, what actually matters? So I won't tell you all the ways in which I analyzed this data, but I did. <laughs> At first, you know, I agreed with them after this. Minerals in the soil didn't, in, the, in this data set, minerals in the soil had no relationship to minerals in the food samples. So for example, the uh, amount of calcium in a tomato had no relationship to the level in the soil because they were doing the soil test too. So that's a little alarming. And local and organic, not higher nutritionally than conventional. And I want to clarify that, of course, this is better. Local and organic is better. But if you're looking for higher nutrition, there's no pattern. It may, there may be for your particular farm, but over the, their data set of you know, thousands of farms, there was no pattern of that. So you could have conventional grocery store produce that was the same as your farmer's market produce. And that soil health, basically, had no relationship to total nutrient density. So it, there, I did start finding patterns and they were they're big differences. So in some cases there could be one lettuce plant that had 200 times more phytonutrients than than the other lettuce plant grown in the same soil, same among different species. Like these differences were giant and we're talking about a 200 times difference. You're talking about 20,000 percent. So this is a big deal. <laughs> I've read other studies since. I didn't end there. I wanted, you know, it just cut was the starting point for me to start learning. So I have seen other studies that pretty persuasively show that you can have a benefit. But the benefit typically is between the, the 0 to 30%. So when you're talking 
is 5,000 percent is a lot less than, that's a conservative version of 20,000. So 50 times higher is, is not that hard to get when, when you're talking about differences, but those differences are genetic, they're by variety. Certain colors, certain varieties tend to be much, much higher consistently regardless of soil type. This is another example. So in this blue, blue corn, 99.5 milligrams of anthocyanins per 100 grams compared to one and a half. One and a half is the white. So this is, this is when you're talking about potatoes, purple potatoes versus white potatoes. This is consistent across all these things. And this comes from, if you're interested in this topic, Eating on the Wild Side is a really great book. Um, just an example, not inventing it. Uh, so what, do you, what really happened? Why has this been declining? Does anyone um, want to hazard a guess? Yes. Uh, uh, stable, uh, right. So it's plant breeding. So the Green Revolution. This has happened at the same time we've degraded the soil and changed our farming practices. And I'm going to argue that this has had a much bigger impact and one that we don't talk about as much. So breeding for high yields with lots of fertilizer, longer shelf life, none of these things correspond to good flavor. They're, they're opposite. Often the higher your yield, the lower your nutrient density. So for years and years of doing this under the influence of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, we have gotten these varieties that don't do as well without that fertilizer and tend to be high yielding without that nutrient density. So, so if you're like me, you would have been like, okay, then great, the solution to this problem is, is easy. I will grow heirlooms. So there is a reason that a lot of farmers don't grow heirlooms. They, they typically do taste better, right? You want to grow those brandy wine tomatoes because they are more delicious and their nutrient density is probably much higher. But they, in general, not in every case, they tend to have lower yields. They tend to be more susceptible to disease and need more care. And so this, at this point, it was still um, a couple of years ago, I was still stuck, right? What am I going to do? I'm an heirlooms, I can't, as a farmer, I can't depend on them. Still stuck. First of all, I wanted to know why. What's wrong with heirlooms? Why can't that be my solution? One thing that people don't realize is that plants are more susceptible to inbreeding depression than dogs are. So when you think about a lot of these pet dogs, they're a little bit f um, famous for having some health issues. They tend to need more care, maybe some special food, some sweaters, they, they need more attention. And we know that and we love them and it's worth it, right? It's like they're our friends. But when we do that for heirlooms, we're not considering that there's a cost that we're paying without really realizing it. And do we want to grow friends and pets and take care of them in our garden? Or do we want to grow food? <laughs> so some people, they want, to, they want those plants dependent on them. And that's fine. It's, it's fine. It's just there's different ways of growing it. And I think a lot of people don't consider their cost they're paying by growing plants that have been so isolated for decades. The industry response to keeping consistency that you get with inbreeding while introducing hybrid vigor is commercial hybrids. So here's a little biology lesson. This is the parent, parent, and the offspring is much bigger. Not just higher yielding, but more disease resistant. These plants were happier. They were more disease resistant. Um, so this is, you could consider this kind of like an heirloom. This is, this is years of being bred within closed populations and not having those wide crosses. So this has really taken over the, the world of industrial agriculture. In 2020, 99% of corn, wheat, cotton, and more are grown from hybrid seed. So this is a new industry. It started in, in less than 100 years ago, and yet this is what our food is mostly grown from. And I'm, it's not just a problem with production agriculture. This is from Johnny's Seed Catalog. If you look this year, I haven't studied it in other years, but it was a little shocking to me that 90% at least of the seeds that they're selling, not just to farmers, but gardeners buy their seeds here too, they have F1, they're F1 hybrids. So those are all commercial hybrids. And that is because there's a market demand for those higher yielding, more disease resistant crops because heirlooms 
you know, have the problems that we talked about. So I'm not saying, and I never thought that commercial hybrids were the solution for me or anybody else. Uh, just, just to show the power of genetic diversity when you're increasing your gene pool. Commercial hybrids don't equal sustainable food systems. One of those reasons we're going to talk more about later is cytoplasmic male sterility, which has is extremely pervasive and nobody talks about it. So we'll get to that. So I was still stuck, right? I don't know, I don't know, what am I gonna do? <laughs> so I don't know, at a certain point, I did find the answer for me. And that was um, a book that I read that just shifted my perspective beyond what I had thought were my options, which were open pollinated and, and a little bit about open pollinated before we move on. I should have mentioned this, so that sounds good, right? A lot of our, our varieties are open pollinated, but they're open pollinated within a very closed population. So they're not wide crosses and they still can display a lot of those symptoms of inbreeding depression. So I had been stuck on what are my, what my choices? Are they hybrids, heirlooms, open pollinated? Do I have to become a plant breeder? Because it's really not part of what I should do. <laughs> so I, read, I, I stumbled on this book, Landrace Gardening, and it was, it was really a mindset shift. First of all, Landrace, what is the definition? Locally adapted, community selected, promiscuously pollinated, and promiscuous is, is the alternative to open pollinated. So these are wide crosses. They're not crosses within a variety that where you would call open pollinated. So the mindset shift is adapting a food crop to a local area and the community preferences over time, as opposed to this, which is adapting the local environment to ensure crop survival every year. This is our mindset. Even as gardeners, we protect the seeds that we buy, kind of like our pets. Um, and this is including soil testing, the things you don't see, adding the calcium to make sure everything is right, those irrigation lines, those plastic, everything about this is modified. This might be an extreme example, but it's, it's at least it was my mindset of like, how do I make sure I have a harvest is modifying the, the soil. And then this is an example of the other mindset, adapt the crops to the local environment. And you can see one of these plants is getting attacked by bugs and one is not. So, why? Uh, why is this getting attacked by bugs? Okay, Daisy, why do you think? I don't know. I think that would be the fact that it has. Uh, maybe it doesn't have the, the, gen the genetic repellent. Yeah, right. It's, it's not, it's not right. It's not, it. it's not used to it. So this plant is going to not produce, these are potato plants, is not going to produce seeds or tubers. And over time, the genetics of this plant will take over, and that's the idea of adapting to a local environment. So this is not a new concept, you know, land races are not new at all. This is how our great grandparents were growing food, not even that long ago, it was just, you know, it, over the last hundred years, this industry and seed companies have taken over and we've forgotten, but it wasn't that long ago that everybody was, and now many indigenous communities around the world are growing this way. There's a difference between these traditional and modern land races. Certain people think of land races as a certain thing, which, is, which for example, are these Mexican corns. These are traditional land races that have been part of a community over many, many, many years. Not just three, but generational. And so a lot of people, like me, have lost that connection. I don't have a generational or any kind of relationship to seeds beyond what I'm starting to work on now. So that would be the modern land races. So for those of us who've lost that connection to seeds, we have to start over. So um, that requires a different mindset. Same thing. Like it's not for everybody and it's not for every seed. You could have a garden in which you have your, your varieties that you have an attachment to over many years. And that doesn't mean you have to grow everything this way. In some cases, people have really been defending their seeds in their community for many years against the corporate interest. So this is another reason to adapt our mindset, is we're not just adapting to our local challenges, we're adapting to the climate as it's changing every year. And we can also bring back the nutrient density that's been lost 
um, reduce our dependence on the supply chain and increase seed security. Both we saw that over the last few years with COVID. You know, whoever controls our seed controls our food. And I just, that's why I'm here. I want to encourage everyone to have more control over their seed and their food and don't trust the bigger interests that don't care about us. So, how? Five guidelines. Number one is celebrate diversity and encourage cross-pollination. And that's the way you get access to that hybrid vigor, those healthier plants. And you get adaptation because every year you can select the best. So how to get started with increasing diversity is to get seeds. And they can be from a seed company or your friends or seed exchanges like this. There's lots of sources of free seeds. And then just mix them up. <laughs> Break all the seed saving rules. This makes seed saving much easier for gardeners because the typical pollination distance requirements and the minimum population sizes makes it really hard for a gardener to feel like they can save, uh, save their seeds without causing inbreeding depression. So the typical guideline would be have 10 plants of the same variety well, and then separate those 30 feet or whatever from another variety well, that's impossible for gardeners, right? So this really is makes these challenges uh, a benefit. You want that mixing. You don't want separation. In most cases, we will talk a little bit about when you do. Number two, encourage selection by the local ecosystem. So here's blossom end rot in a tomato. And you probably have heard that if you have blossom end rot, you don't have enough calcium in your soil and you aren't watering correctly. And then you feel terrible and you should do those things next year. <laughs> You're a loser. You don't know about gardening. And the truth is that it's genetic. It's not your fault. Toss that one and save seeds of the tomatoes that don't and don't feel bad about it. Like this mindset needs to shift of that. I need to add calcium so that my tomatoes don't get blossom and drop. Um, so this is an example. These are beans. It's a, I have the beans back here. It's a diverse mix in the first year. Some of these are fine and some of these are yellow and some are getting eaten by bugs and that's the power of diversity and selection. So some of them will die and they're not meant to grow in my ecosystem. And same here, I mean, this we saw this potato plant is just not going to do well. And you don't have to go out and pull it. It's just that you're not going to be saving seeds from it. And if some pollen from this plant does get into this plant, well, that's OK, too. There's genetic diversity that you know, is going to help everybody. So. so then, number three, select for traits that you value. And those are really individual, but often it's selecting the tastiest. And that will vary based on who you are, what your husband likes. Moving towards nutrient density, back to this question. These antioxidants are associated with colors. So dark colors have more of those phytonutrients. So this is <clears throat> beta carotene that has much higher levels than this. So when you're selecting, you're going for flavor, but also nutrition. This is the one you would want to save seeds from. Yeah. OK, so you must save seeds. And there's a lot of ways that seeds remember and improve over time. Seed microbiomes, each uh, seed has different colony of bacteria and fungi on it that help it in that particular location. So when you're buying seeds every year from elsewhere, you're not getting that benefit. Then epigenetics, plant memory, things that we don't fully understand, do understand some um, genetics through selection. Number five, community. So it's hard to grow in this way with in a vacuum. Um, the reasons for that is you can adapt faster when you're sharing your best and there's a bigger pool to, to select from, improve seed access for everyone in the community, and increasing genetic diversity so that when you want to bring in new genetics so that over time you're not getting too narrow and then start seeing inbreeding depression, you can share with your neighbors and bring in more diversity over time. I did mention we shouldn't breed everything with everything. And Here's a few pointers. You don't want to cross your flower corn and your sweet corn. Hot peppers will cross with sweet peppers. Most people don't want that. The decorative peppos have the bitter gene. So if you've ever been told if you save squash seeds, they will become bitter, it's from that. But none of our other squash varieties or species have that bitterness aspect. So I would just avoid decorative peppos and wild things, and then avoid mixing in anything that is gross. 
So male sterility, avoid hybrids. You've probably heard that you shouldn't save seeds from hybrids because you don't know what you're gonna get. But I would say sometimes you know that's okay when we're changing our mindset. The reason that you should avoid them is because of this male sterility gene. And a lot of small seeded crops are all grown this way. Brassicas, carrots, onions, um, different ones like that. But at this point, we don't know what's being bred with cytoplasmic male sterility. They're working on doing everything with it. So cucumbers, squash, um, there's a little bit longer of a definition in the resource booklet. But I would avoid all F1 hybrids. This is what it looks like in the seed catalogs and not for the reasons that you've been told.